Hello, welcome to episode 33 of Knitter Matters. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're watching us live or you're watching the replay later. Welcome indeed. I'm Cheryl Lampard. My company is Style Matters International. I'm an image consultant and throughout my life I've had two passions that are sewing and knitting. I used to be the proud owner of a yarn shop in Brighton, England, and much as I love sewing, knitting is my therapy. It's something I do every day. I find it extremely relaxing, and I know many of you do too. Um, as we go along, please feel free to put any questions in the thread below. I, I can't actually answer them while we're, we're doing this, the, uh, uh, the Facebook Live, but I will get back to you as soon as possible afterwards. Feel free as well to put questions during the week. That's what Knitter Matters is all about. I want to answer your questions and help you out as knitters, if you have any questions. Uh, if I see your name pop up, I will give you a shout out, but um, otherwise I'll get back to you afterwards. Now, last week we had a few issues um, with the sound for the first few moments of the Facebook Live. We did actually do another video, which is on the Facebook page, under videos and on our YouTube page, so you can see what you, you missed. But essentially, I was actually telling you why I chose the Carefree Cardi uh, by Mary Maxim as our project. And I'll just run through that very quickly. A fuller explanation is in that video, but I'm sorry if you were watching. We did have sound afterwards, but the first few moments were a bit hectic. So I chose the project because it's versatile. It's a very versatile cardigan to wear. It's an open front, so super easy, just as great over jeans as snuggling up on the sofa. From a knitting perspective, it's really simple because you've got a 12 row pattern all the way through it. Um, plus uh, another pattern for the front bands. There's no button band. There's some shaping, but you don't have to worry about stitching on a button band afterwards. So it's a great project for beginners, but there's enough interest in the stitch pattern to keep intermediate kn knitters happy uh, um, so they don't get bored. It knits up very quickly as well. There's four sizes in the kit, small, medium, large, and extra large. There's also four colors the black rag, the brown rag, the grey rag, and the denim rag that I'm working on. It's very easy care. It could be machine washed and then put in the tumble dryer on gentle. The kit itself is $24.99. It's very affordable. If you do choose to buy that from Mary Maxim, don't forget to put the promo code Cheryl in. Okay, I need to go back a bit. Put the promo code Cheryl in at checkout to get your 20% discount. And that applies whether you buy this kit or anything else. There's some lovely things on the, their website at this time of year. So whatever you buy, you'll get 20% off the highest price item in your cart, as long as you put the promo code Cheryl in. Okay. So now I'm going to take my seat. I'm going to ask the camera to move to the table and we'll get started. This, as I said, is part two of the Carefree Cardi. And what we I wanted to go through was some of the pattern instructions, which are very well written. I have enlarged this because the pattern itself is a bit shiny. So I've enlarged this and I'll be sort of going through this. It needs to be flat, my cameraman is telling me. So I'll be showing you how we do the shaping on the, on the front. I've done the right front. And my stitches are actually still on the needle, and I'll explain that for you later. They're actually on the stitch holder there. But let me show you about this shaping on the front. So once you've done, we did two patterns here. We did the garter check pattern, which is the main body. And then we did this seeded rib, which is a two row pattern. Super easy. And it's over 19 stitches. That doesn't change. This garter check pattern doesn't change either until you've done 14 inches of the work from the cast on edge. And you need to uh, end on a wrong side row so you're ready to start with the right side. Oh, Nancy Rogness. Hi, welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. So after you've done 14 inches, you start shaping. Now, the decreases are made every... Um, fourth row until you reach a certain amount uh, of, of stitches. Now, it, the pattern does say you can integrate the, the stitches into 
the main pattern and, and keep this pattern going. I thought I would be clever and do that. And I didn't actually like how it looked. It, it seemed to disrupt the pattern. What I ended up doing, I ripped those few rows out and then I started doing them in stockinette stitch. And I like that much better because actually it follows the line of this nice seeded rib. So I'm going to show you Maureen. Hi Maureen, thank you for joining us. So we're following the line of this seeded rib. I chose to do that. You may want to do it differently. Essentially what I'm doing is just stocking it stitch rather than trying to keep the pattern going. And I'll show you actually that very easy increase, uh, sorry, decrease on my uh, little sample here because I think it's easier for you to see. Let me sort myself out there. Right. So what we do, just imagine that that's 14 inches and you're starting to shape it. I have done a few decreases there so you can see and I'll, I'm just going to do one for you now. So I do my 19 stitches. I've got enormously long needles here uh, in this size. I'm doing my 19 stitches of the seeded rib which the first row is super simple well both rows are super simple but obviously on the right side you can see better where what you're doing and you will have placed your markers this is where markers are super helpful and when you see that m on the pattern it means marker so that's my marker this is now where i do the decrease so i'm just going to slip my marker and i'm going to do slip one knit one pass stitch over and now I'm going to continue with my pattern. So I'll just get to the end of this row. And that's what I'm doing every four rows. I've just done it every row there just for speed of showing you. And on this, on the garter check pattern, which I'm doing now, your right side rows are pretty much always the same. You're basically knitting three and purling one. Oh, what have I done? I meant to slip my knee. Right, I was going to give myself a yarn over there, which I don't need. Okay. So you can see there how keeping my, obviously this is much thicker yarn, how keeping my decreases almost in stock uh, in stockinette stitch really fits much better in with that pattern up the front what i was doing was trying to be clever so that on the wrong side here it would still be you know consistently going up as a, that would be a purl stitch for the right side but it just didn't look right but whatever you want to do is fine and you know the blessing of this rag fabric that we're making is that you know if you have got a little error it's not going to show so it's a wonderful yarn to start off with if this is a first garment project so that's shaping the neck um, the pattern then so you keep doing that until it tells you to shape for the armholes let me put that on the black can you see that okay there so shaping for the armholes it's a very easy shaping we bind off a certain amount of stitches and then for the next couple of alternate rows we we do a decrease and then we carry on now note here you get to a certain point where you can't keep that garter check pattern up otherwise you get just a few stitches and it, it kind of doesn't look right so you can make it you can keep doing it if you want to i made a decision that once i got to the armhole I wasn't going to keep trying to do that pattern. So I just carried on with stocking st stitch, stockinette stitch, and I think it looks much better. So what you are doing though, at the same time, you are still carrying on increasing for decreasing, I'm sorry. You're still decreasing up that neck edge. So you get a nice sort of slope. Now, it bothered me at first that the pattern doesn't actually state how many stitches I decrease overall. I kind of am a bit of a control freak and I like to know that. I'm doing the large size. I actually, at the end of it, counted that I had done 17 decreases and it's one every four rows. 
but the pattern does actually state how many stitches you need to end up with so that's okay that's important you need to know that but I would have liked them to have said it's a certain amount of decreases then I then I know how many I, I, I'm, I'm doing okay it's another check for me if I'm doing the pattern correctly so my armhole is shaped now what I have to do is keep knitting this to match the back now I haven't done my back uh, yet because although I said to you start with the back which is the normal knitting order um, I wanted to get this front done because this is actually the most complicated part of the knitting if you can do the front you can do anything else on, on this and it's not a complex thing but you've got two different patterns to deal with plus some shaping so that's why I said it's the most complicated bit so do the back first you get used to doing the garter check pattern so by the time you, you've got to, to the front, you'll be an expert with that. So I will keep knitting this for next week because next week I'm going to show you how to put, the, put it all together. Now let's go on to the sleeve because there's shaping in the sleeve and I want to show you that. Okay, I'm going to show you the sleeve. Talk to you a bit about the sleeve, how that works. I enlarge my pattern so that they... I could see it and give you the instructions and it wasn't shiny so the sleeve again depending what size you're doing you're going to cast on a certain amount of stitches you're going to place your markers it tells you where to place your markers and the garter check pattern is within those markers okay and as you go up you move the markers up now you do start increasing uh, I think you're increasing every you, you increase on the fifth row then every sixth row that's because they want you to do the increase, it makes sense, on a right side row. And you do the increase at the front and the end of the row. It's not one increase on a right side, one increase on a wrong side. You're doing both increases at both ends. Sorry, one increase at both ends. And I chose to do a make one increase. We've done that in a previous episode, but you can do any increase that you're comfortable with. You can just do a simple knit into the front and back if you want. Again, with this stitch pattern, it's all going to blend in to this, this nice uh, design. So you will do your first increase at each end of the fifth row, then every sixth row until there's a certain amount of stitches. Now, what it does say is as you go up and you start getting more stitches, you can incorporate those into the pattern. If you don't want to do that, you can keep doing the stockinette stitch, which is either side of the markers. I started to, once I got a few stitches either side of a complete pattern, so my markers would have gone up, oh, there actually. Uh, once I got, you know, enough to do a full repeat, then I started to do that. But I didn't want my full repeat going to the, right at the edge. Because having some stockinette there is going to make life easier when you come to sew it up. That When we do the seaming, it's just going to blend ha, seamlessly in. You won't see it. Remember also, it's on the underside of the arm. It's a sleeve. The seam is going underneath the arm. So honestly, again, if you sort of decide that that's too difficult to do or you don't want to take it right to the edge, you don't have to. It's not going to show. But I chose to just bring that in as and when I thought that worked. But I still wanted a bit of a stockinette stitch border. So I kept four or five stitches as my border. And I only brought the pattern out when I had enough to do a full repeat. So as you can see, I have brought it out here. Or I brought it out lower down then, then up here. Okay. And on both sides. Now, let's talk about the sleeve cap. I'm going to fold that down so you can see it a bit camera can see it you okay there yeah so the the sleeve cap was quite interesting I thought it was going to be a much more gentle sleeve cap than that but it's actually more like a almost like a cut out fabric sleeve cap so it's more of a set in sleeve I thought it was going to be a, a much more relaxed kind of almost just a very gentle slope but it's not it's quite severe shaping and that's that's fine and again where we are at the sleeve cap once you get to a certain amount of length you cast off uh, stitches at, 
on a right side row and then on the row going back on a wrong side row you're keeping you, your pattern you must keep your pattern here and then you knit a certain amount straight and you're in the garter check pattern by the time you get to your shaping for the sleeve cap there's no stockinette stitch so you're just going to have to keep an eye on your patterning you are going to take this to the edge okay and then after you've done a certain amount of inches you, you start decreasing and i think it was two stitches yes it's two stitches every row yeah until you get to a certain amount of stitches so it, it, it gives you a sort of fairly strange shape in some ways but um i'll be showing you how to set that in next week but the important thing is to remember your pattern needs to come to the edge when you get to the sleeve shaping so you're building your your decreases are in pattern okay because otherwise what this is going to show that's going to look very odd at the shoulder point if that's not in pattern but quite honestly by the time you get to this point you really have had a lot of practice with doing both the garter check and the stocking stitch at the side either side of the markers so it shouldn't give you any problem okay so next week i'll be showing you how to sew in the sleeve and finish off the cardi okay right the other part of today is all about finding your fibers I wrote that as a title for it and afterwards I thought it sounded a bit like a breakfast cereal. I should have just talked about fibre facts really. Let's get this out of the way. So there are a huge array of yarns available. I'm going to bring all these across because I'll be playing with these in a minute. There's nothing nicer than playing with yarns. So I'll just reassemble them on my table and then I'll talk you, you through what I'm doing. Fun and games here. Lovely. Okay, so fibre type alone doesn't determine how the yarn will look. And fibres are either filaments or they're staple fibres. Filaments are long, continuous strands of fibre, and they can actually be miles long. All synthetics are manufactured as filament yarn, but they can and often are cut into shorter staple lengths, then spun into yarn. Silk is the only natural filament yarn. This, this is not silk, but I'll be showing you why this is here um, in a moment. Okay, sorry, I thought there was an instruction coming from the cameraman there. So your staple fibers, your staple fibers, unlike filaments, are shorter and they're measured generally in inches or centimeters. The other thing you have is that filament uh, yarns tend to be smooth and shiny. Um, this is a good one. This is sort of smooth and again, this is interesting the way this is spun. This is a, an acrylic, but it, it's, it's really quite shiny. Um, staple fibers have a slightly more matte appearance. They're slightly rougher because natural fibers in particular, they have a, a scale to them. It's like human hair, the scales lift. Um, so then they're, they're usually not as shiny. For natural fibres, the longer the staple, the smoother it looks and sp spun. So that's why long-haired merino wool sheep, or long-haired merino sheep, and their wool and long staple Egyptian cottons are highly prized. And this is actually a very high quality merino wool. I did this hat in it. I've yet to sew it up, but it, you can see actually how smooth it is. And it almost does have a sheen to it. This is the yarn. And I stuck a piece of tape on it because it tends to unravel very quickly but I wanted to show you this because this is a great example of the other thing that you'll find with yarn when yarn is spun you have strands of whatever it is that are then spun around each other so two ply is basically they're single strands which have already been spun and then they're spun together so a two strand two ply is two strands twisted together essentially but you can have any number of plies you can have three plies obviously four ply and so on and so on so this is a perfect example this is actually an Italian yarn um, and you can order it in different plies which is really quite interesting um, so 
you can I think they do up to an eight ply on this but they go down to a sort of a single ply which is almost like knitting with a cobweb um, but it's useful to, to have that facility the one thing about this yarn is although each single strand is twisted the strands themselves are not twisted in the yarn so it's it's lovely to knit with but it is a bit splitty um, I had to constantly check and I like to knit with quite pointy needles or something like this but I had to constantly check that my yarn wasn't splitting and there's a I think there's a few points or oh, maybe not but I know I had to unpick a few stitches every now and then because I split the ply so it's probably not a yarn uh, for a beginner but it, it is beautiful okay so that's about plies another thing I want to mention worsted yarn now worsted yarn in the UK Worsted yarn is spun from longer fibres and they're combed to lie parallel to create a smooth, firm fill. But in the US, this is called classic wool worsted. In the US, worsted refers to a medium weight yarn rather than the way the yarn is start, uh, spun. It can be both, but if you're shopping online from you know, a US site from the UK, you, you just might need to check that what you're buying is, is true worsted or it's just not or it's uh, you, you know are you just buying the generic term from it so do check that but worsteds are often used for um, sock yarns uh, anything that's going to have a lot of wear worsteds are, are used for so this is a, a patens which we're very familiar with in the U UK but this is a classic wool worsted so if you see that uh, uh, on a US site and you're from the UK just check that you are buying what you think you're buying let me just take a swig of water here Mm. excuse me <clears throat> okay now I want to talk to you about the different types of fi fibers there's three basic categories there are animal based fibers there are plant based fibers and then there are <clears throat> synthetics excuse me <clears throat> so animal of animal based fibers there's a number but let me there's a lot of them I mean but let me go through the most popular ones so animal based fibers generally provide great insulation they're breathable um, this is a gorgeous wool and wool is the most widely used different sheep different sheeps different sheep breed different sheep breeds oh Lisa hi Lisa Brennan Brenkin sorry thank you thank you for joining us so much so different sheep breeds produce fibers with differing characteristics anything from soft lofty merino this is a lovely merino um, and it's an iron weight you can see that lovely twist to it as well I love this to, to a tough hardy Shetland wool again um, very useful for sort of hard wearing fibers wool takes dye extremely well so you're going to get a lot of great colors in that but heat moisture and agitation felt it which you might want to do for certain projects but anyone who's shrunk a wool sweater will know that once you've shrunk it and felted it you can't do anything with it other than use it for something else um, and I am afraid in my younger days I have done that very thing I had a beautiful sweater um, that was a shop bought sweater and it ended up like a, a size a, a, you know it was a complete miniature sweater by the time I'd washed it never did that again uh, cashmere cashmere is from the underside of cashmere goats it's extremely soft it blooms almost when it's knitted it has a lovely loft it takes dye very well it is weaker than wool so it's often combined with other fibers. This is um, a merino and cashmere yarn exactly for that purpose. Pure cashmere, of course, is very expensive. Oh, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. Thanks for joining us. Pure cashmere is, is very expensive um, and it is weaker. So be careful what you choose to knit with it. it don't knit cashmere socks in it, in, in pure cashmere. They're not, you could do all that knitting and you'll go through them in, in, in weeks. But you can do cashmere and wool, but make sure the percentage of wool is a bit higher than the cashmere. You'll still get that lovely feel of the softness of the cashmere. Um, I've got this. I'm probably going to make some sort of hat with it. And it's, it's beautiful, really soft. And in this one, there's actually 
yeah, it's 70% merino and 30% cashmere. So even though it's a lower percentage of cashmere, it's, it's super soft. It's lovely. Okay. Mohair. Let's get rid of that one. Mohair. And now, mohair doesn't come from mohs, whatever they are. It is from the fleece of angora goats. Mohair is lightweight, warm, it's fluffy. It's a real fun fibre. And again, it's a great one if your knitting is not perfect because the fluffiness will disguise any errors. However, it's not a great choice if you're doing a very intricate pattern because you're not going to see it. Um, if it's a very, uh, if you want good stitch definition, you're not going to get that with mohair. It's not that sort of yarn. This is kid mohair. And again, it's from the same supplier as that twisted as my merino. Again, I can buy this. Can you see there? You can actually buy this just one strand if you want, sort of one ply. You, you could make a wedding ring shawl with that. And a wedding ring shawl, by the way, is so fine that you can actually kind of roll it and slide it through the um, diameter of a wedding ring. How cool is that? Anyway, um, this is a kid mohair and kid mohair is spun from the fleece of kid angora goats. Again, it's often blended with wool. Uh, to give it some strength and to bind it. You know, pure mohair is tricky on its own. It, it sort of pulls apart when you knit it. So you'll often find it with a small percentage of wool or nylon or other fi fibers to give it strength. And just for the record, Angora rabbits produce Angora, not Angora goats. So it's a bit confusing, this one. Mohair is from Angora goats, but Angora rabbits produce Angora. Now, alpaca yarn is from the animal of the same name. So that's a nice, easy one to remember. They, alpacas produce hollow fibers and they spin into a really soft, warm, lightweight yarn. This is 100% alpaca. Oh, and it feels like a cloud. It feels, oh, I just want to sit and touch it. It's the joy to knit with. But unlike wool, alpaca doesn't spring back into shape. So again, it's often blended with other yarns to help that shape retention. And this is um, a John Arben yarn. I put a post about their Knit by Numbers um, yarn collection earlier in the week because they do an amazing collection of colors. This is a four ply, it's called Alpaca Supreme, and it's a blend of British Alpaca, Merino, and Mulberry Silk. And you can see just that luster, even though it's 20% silk, you can see the sheen on that. And it knits up beautifully. Again, you've seen this little sample before, but I just wanted to show you. So alpaca, when it's blended, is a really useful yarn. It's going to be, it's going to give me more shape than this one will. So I've got to be careful what I choose to knit in that because it's not going to spring back into shape. This will give me more shape. And I know it does because when I, when it's off the needles, it's, it's much springier. This is blocked. Okay. So that's alpaca. Silk is not a hair, it's a protein fiber. I already said that silk is the only natural filament fiber. This is uh, silk um, four ply. It's got silk and wool in it, silk and merino wool, but it's, it's heavy on the silk. And you can see that gorgeous sort of luster as I move it you know, in front of the, the light. It's beautiful. Um, silk is from silkworm cocoons and a single cocoon produces over 1500 feet of silk filament. Silk is a very good insulator. It's exceptionally strong, but it is prone to fading and stretching. And that's why it's often blended with other fibers to add the luster and the strength. And it also reduces the cost. So again, choose your projects carefully. If you're doing a sweater in pure silk, you're gonna find that it actually probably, you know, the shape is going to go um, after a while. So, you know, think about that. It's great for scarves and shawls and things like that, though. Now we're on to plant fibers. Cotton, of course, is the one that we would automatically think of. Cotton is light, it's absorbent, it's stronger when wet than dry, and it's easy to care for. It doesn't have much elasticity. And it is prone to stretching. But I always found with cotton knits, even if they stretch, once you wash them again, they, they pull back in. So you just have to understand that that's the characteristic of the fabric. 
This is mercerized cotton and you can see there's a sheen to that. You can see there's also a twist to it. A mercerized cotton has been treated to make it smoother, more lustrous and less prone to shrinkage. So that's a good choice for, for sweaters. I don't have an example of linen, but linen is, is an, another fabric that's wonderful for hot weather wear. It draws moisture away from the body. And I love li linen fabric, but I confess to not really like knitting with linen yarn, not 100% linen yarn anyway. It's very stiff to knit with. I don't enjoy it actually knitting with it. That's why I don't have a sample to show you. But you can get linen blends, which are softer, and washing and wearing the linen yarn over time will also soften it. Um, another one that I don't have um, an example to show you, but I do want to mention it, is bamboo. Um, a very dear friend of mine went through chemo a few years ago, and I made some hats for her in various fibers. And she said that those with bamboo were the most comfortable. Scalps can get very sensitive during chemo treatment. And she said that the bamboo and cotton mixes were the most comfortable to wear. So, um, you know, that's something to bear in mind if you're knitting for somebody with sensitive skin or somebody that's um, going through a, a chemo. Now we come on to that huge family of synthetics. Since nylon was introduced by DuPont in 1938, there are many, many synthetics. And most notable of those are acrylic and poly polyesters. And the today's are a far cry from the original synthetics. But because they're so strong, nylon, because it's so strong, nylon is often added to um, other yarns for durability. Uh, sock yarns, it's often uh, added to those for durability. So acrylics are found in every weight from lace weight to jumbo and in every color. They take dye very well. Let's get that that right way. They take dye very well. Um, the fibers imitate wool, but they don't have the same insulating properties. So if you want something that's really going to keep you warm, you might want something with a, a, a wool and acrylic mix. Acrylics are excellent choices for beginners, and that's why we've worked with them a lot on this because Knitter Matters started off for beginners. So it's a good choice. It's affordable. It's easy care. As I said, it can be machine washed and tumble dry. It's also a great choice for baby and children's clothing or pet items and blankets. Anything that's got to be washed a lot. It's also a hypoallergenic yarn. And that's something I should have said about many of the plant fibers as well. If you are allergic to animal fibers, then plant fibers and acrylics are probably going to be a better choice for you. They're not going to give you um, an allergic reaction. And they're frequently found in combination with other fibers. So this one is um, an acrylic and wool mix. It's 80% acrylic, 20% wool. Very nice to knit up with. Really, really gives you a nice, you do get that woolly, wool feel actually. It's very easy to knit with. I like it a lot. This one I've used a lot, the Mary Max Woodlands. This is, you can feel, I know you can't feel it, but I can. You can actually feel it's that much softer. It's a, acrylic and alpaca. Just that small amount of alpaca that's in it gives it, you know, real softness to it. And you get that kind of hairiness that you get with um, the, uh, some of the animal fibers. The rag yarn, of course, that we're using for our cardigan. This is actually 100% acrylic. But again, it's got that really nice twist. So it's a, all sorts of things um, in acrylic yarns. And of course, oh, I did show you this one, but I wanted to bring this out again. This is a really interesting one. This is very sheeny. And again, talking about plies, it's got several twisted together. Unlike my red yarn, where it had several plies, but they weren't twisted. This has got several plies that are twisted in themselves and then twisted again. So you do get a really interesting texture with that, as we saw in... The knitting that we did a little earlier and lastly novelty yarns you know acrylics and synthetics only synthetics can produce something like this you, you won't get this in a natural fiber um, how you use it is up to you but you could just add that in there to give it some fun this one again is another furry kind of faux fur type of yarn. So if you want a novelty yarn, the chances are it's either going to be 100% synthetic or a high percentage of synthetic because that's what's going to produce the fun stuff. Um, 
So I hope that quick roundup of yarn choices, or oh, we've overrun a bit, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to ask the camera to come back to me so I can sign off. Thank you again very much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Um, if you've got anything you want us to cover in a future episode, please let us know. That's what we're here for. As always, this episode and all others are uploaded to the page under videos and to our YouTube channel. So please like us, follow us, subscribe to us, whatever you have to do on social media. We're also on Instagram as well. Um, you can also email me if you have or message me if you have a particular question. But I always like you to put them on the page because if you've got the question, other people probably have too. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's Knit and Matters. Next week, we'll be sewing up the Carefree Cardi and finishing it off, uh, as well as doing another part, something else, which I haven't yet decided on. So between now and then, stay well, stay safe, keep calm and keep knitting. And I will see you next week. Bye for now. <laughs>